have a dedicated team for any managed service needs. Today, you're gonna to be hearing from two different speakers, Sri and Lokesh. I do want to mention to go ahead as the webinar happens to go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box. We'll be answering those live. And if for any reason we can't get to your question, we'll make sure to go ahead and follow up with the answer. So like I said, I'm excited for you to hear about everything from Lokesh. So I'm gonna pass it on to him to begin the webinar. Thank you, Alex. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Let's start with local time. Today, we will talk about how we can measure success of our technology program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that, guys. I think we lost some sound, but we're working on fixing that. Just give us a minute or two. And thank you for those that let us know. Alex, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Hello. Sure. Yeah, you're audible. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry, everyone. I think there is some network glitch here. Um, okay, so let me start over again. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, um, based on your local time. And as Alex mentioned, today we'll be talking about how you can measure success of your data governance program. And if we really think about success, it's binary, right? Either you're successful or you're not, and there's no midway. So it's a zero or one, and hence it's binary. And let me illustrate that by telling you a story slight modification from what you might have heard multiple times. Story of a thirsty crow. So there was a crow in Austin, Texas, and he was invited to attend a feast. And this was around May or June when it's summer in Texas. So he went to the feast, he attended, had a good time and had a lot of good food. And then he went home and slept. When he woke up after a couple of hours, he was really thirsty. And then water was not to be found anywhere. So he started uh, to fly in search of water. And then after a couple of hours of searching, he stumbled across a pot which had water, but very minimal. Um, not, to, not at least to the level where he could dip his beak and start drinking. So he started thinking what he can do about it. And then he spotted a couple of other birds and crows. So he thought of an idea. He went to them and asked if they could help him. And the crows asked, okay, what, what do you want our help with? And he said, um, I'm really thirsty and there is a pot. I want to drink that water. And if you could help me putting pebbles one by one, um, the water level will rise and I'll be able to quench my thirst. So they said, okay, why should we help you? And he was like, okay, I just attended a feast and I know where it was. And there's um, leftover food, it's very tasty. And if you help me, I'll tell you the address. You can go enjoy the food. So the crows were like, okay, and that's fair enough. Um, uh, we'll help you. So eventually they started putting pebbles one by one and then gradually the water level rose. They were all able to drink water. And as promised, our crow, he gave them the address and everybody enjoyed the leftovers, had a mini feast. Now let's try to fit the story in the context of data governance. So essentially the inaccessible water level, it's the hidden value of data, which is really stopping us from uh, getting the insights, right? The true hidden insights that we want to visualize. So there is a barrier. Now in your data estate, that barrier could be because of your data quality issues or because of silos, which really doesn't give you a holistic view so that you cannot be data driven because of those barriers. And typically what we do is we define a process so that we can overcome that barrier and start realizing the value from our data. To summarize, the crew had a clear objective in his mind. He was thirsty and he wanted to increase the level of water so that his thirst could be quenched. Let's do a quick recap 
keeping the ingredients of success as a framework in the context of the story and see how it fits. As we talked about, it should be aligned to the business driver. So here we had a very clear objective that is to quench the thirst. It was driven by his objective and supported by his other friends. And really, if you see, they took an iterative approach. It was not a single stone. It was one pebble at a time with focus on critical elements. So think of elements like, I mean, we focused on the pebbles and stones, not a single big stone or straws or other uh, objects around, right? The focus was only on what could help us to achieve those objectives. The, me the, the success was measured through adoption. Um, it was a practical approach. It was doable and everybody came together. It was embedded at point of access where he wanted to drink. And eventually they all celebrated when success was realized. With that said, let's get started. Till now we have been talking about planning phase and one of the important artifacts that we discussed was a data governance charter. And essentially what goes in a governance charter is the stakeholder list. Who or which team is responsible for the overall program? Who takes the funding decisions? Who is the audience who is going to benefit from our efforts? The outcome, what do we expect to see at the end of our uh, implementation? What are those values that can be realized? And the overall objective, what is it that we are trying to achieve at an enterprise scale? And when we put all of these three together, it gives us the user story. So similar to the crow objective, it's as a dash or role, I want this outcome so that my this and this objective is met. And, in, and when we talk about measurement, we are essentially measuring the objective, which is binary. It's either a yes or a no. And as data governance practitioners, our idea or we strive to always get a yes as an answer to that objective. What we really don't want is that no. And if it's a no, then there is a problem that we need to take a look into. Let's discuss this with a couple of examples. Let's say there is an executive and he or she wants to know that information they receive is correct so that they have confidence in the report. So the data that makes to the report, they have to trust it to be truly data driven. And from a data user perspective, um, maybe they are spending a lot of time fixing data quality issues on a daily basis. So they want to know who they can contact to fix data at the source, the upstream data, so that they do not waste time. These are classic examples and uh, we are capturing the pain points of different personas of our stakeholders. All right, so how do we get to yes? Uh, we have talked about collecting the user, uh, user stories and uh, we understand that we want yes for an answer, but how do we do that? Initially, we set up a meeting with the stakeholders, right? So let's say you started with your iteration one, or even if uh, you are far ahead in your journey and executing a mature uh, governance program, communication is a key aspect, right? So we meet with the stakeholders and ask them, was your objective met? Did we meet what we started with? And if the answer is yes, then it's a pat on the back. But if it's no, that's when we need to start thinking what might have gone wrong. So number one thing that we can maybe look at is the training aspect. No matter how good the implementation was, but if we have not trained our audience or the consumers to interact with the solution, how to consume that solution, if they are not trained, it's not gonna work. So we need to make sure there is a robust training program in place and make sure that our audience understands what we have done. And if training was accounted for, but still the answer is no, then maybe there is an inherent problem with the implementation itself. And we need to take a step back and see how well we have implemented it. And if the implementation is good too, then I, it might not be your problem. Maybe you're just talking to the wrong stakeholders who were maybe not involved in the part of the process and maybe who don't understand what we are trying to achieve here. The real problem is if we have not accounted for training or if we have not done an, if we have not done a good job with the implementation and that's where we need to start looking at the KPIs or the key performance indicators. So let's take uh, a look at some of the different flavors of KPIs that we can go about capturing. Number one is training KPIs, right? That's the first step that we need to take a look into. So let's say we have been talking to a multiple person of people could be an auditor who is interested in seeing how we are capturing the information, what are the different systems and data stores, data sets, attributes that, that are captured, how they are stored, how does the data move from source to visualization, and do we have controls or not? 
Second could be a risk analyst who is maybe working to define a risk surface. He, need, he or she needs to identify the sensitive data and how we are uh, managing that risk. Owners and stewards um, who, who strive to make sure that the data is interpreted correctly by the consumers. They are, easy, they are able to find and understand the data and use it in a way that is intended to be and not guess the data meaning. Developers, so oftentimes we have an existing, maybe a data warehouse or data marts and then business requirements change. And if there is a need to accommodate a new business request, we need to take a look at the existing application and understand impact of that change. We don't want one change to break several other things and maybe cause a regression. So a developer has that intention in his mind to get that information. And a business analyst, maybe he or she spots a problem on the report and they want to make sure uh, that prior to that data making to the report was, was were there quality controls around it, was the data quality dimensions measured or not. So these, these could be some of your user stories. And once you have done your implementation, we can define a KPI around measuring the percentage of data stakeholders enabled because we want them to understand how to use it, how to go about finding their answers using our solution. So that is number one KPI that we can think of. Once training is taken care of, and as we saw in the flowchart, the next aspect to take a look is the implementation. So before we talk about implementation KPIs, let's quickly rewind what we discussed on webinar two, the governance map. And what we essentially did was define the data governance business drivers and the technology landscape. So things like, uh, so the products and solutions these days, they provide us capability to uh, inventorize our systems, mechanisms to draw data lineage, policies, the privacy aspects, the catalog and business clusters. So we define the individual components of our solution landscape. And then we go about asking questions, for example, where is my data located and how is it used? Now, if you think about it, I should be able to go to different systems, understand what are the different systems involved that stores the data I'm looking for. So a system inventory, and then the data lineage. How is my data flowing from source to visualization so that I can track it? What are the different quality scores along the hops? These kind of answers. Similarly, you can define all of your user stories and map it to the solution landscape. And as a result of this exercise, you get a list of deliverables. So a deliverable artifact could be, you need to define a business glossary, you need to create a catalog with maybe on-premise systems or cloud systems, hybrid systems, whatever it takes, the, privacy, the uh, data privacy or the sensitive data, classifying that sensitive data and et cetera. So once we have this mapping done, we can think about our implementation KPIs. Things like percentage of data stores cataloged. Maybe in your first iteration, you have not cataloged enough data stores and that is why your consumer is saying, no, my answer, uh, no, my objective is not met. So you should see that if you have captured a user story, what are the different systems? What are the different data sets that are under the purview of that particular user story? Only then we can uh, expect our consumers to truly benefit from it. Next KPI could be around uh, keeping track of number of data stores scanned for privacy classification. Now at an enterprise scale, we have thousands of data sets spread across multiple systems. Again, on-premise, hybrid, and cloud, multi-cloud. From a privacy aspect, right? So even if you are starting small, say you want, say you are in a regulated industry and you are uh, capturing PII as well as PCI, maybe in the first iteration you are going about PCI. But then that has to be exhaustive. It's not that you select a subset of 10 tables and expect uh, to see some success around privacy. We need to catalog all of those systems and classify those systems for PII data across, across your uh, data estate. Critical data with quality scores across dimensions. It's a, by this point, we have discussed it a couple of times that we do not go about governing data across our enterprise we are only interested in governing critical data. And if we are talking about critical data, it has to have good quality support. Otherwise, how, how, we, how can we expect our executives to trust those reports? And to ascertain that, we need to define those quality scores. Next is critical data labeled. 
So if we are talking about enhancing the self-service analytics capability, we need to label the data. So I, as a data analyst or a regular user who is maybe new to the organization, I should be able to find the data, the relevant data, understand what it means and trust it by virtue of the quality score dimensions we just talked about. And then the critical data with end-to-end -end lineage. So when you are talking about the audit of use case story, they are interested typically in seeing the different variety or the flavors of data. What are the systems where it is stored? How it is proliferated? The different controls. And data lineage diagram gives us just that, the journey of data from inception to the, and manage the entire data life cycle, the retention periods, et cetera. So these are some of the metrics that can help you and give you a view of how well your program is doing. On another note, some of the other KPIs in terms of metrics and numbers could be the business glossaries identified. And we, here we are not talking about the data dictionary, right? Because it's difficult to manage. We're talking about so many attributes, but business glossaries represent the key business concepts in terms of data domains. So your customer domain or your product domain, um, things like that at a high level. And then we assign that ownership uh, to those business glossaries. Keeping a track of that gives us an indicator of what are the different business concepts across multiple business areas and subject areas that have been captured so far. And what is your expected, uh, uh, like what is the expected scope? And then we can start modeling the Delta. Another uh, metric could be around the policies and processes. So these policies could be regulated policies or it could be your internal policies. Like how do you want your data creators to work with data? Uh, so a policy around that. How do you expect your consumers of data? So for example, your analysts or maybe data engineers, they are writing SQL queries, maybe dealing with PII and PCI data, and you want them not to download the results on the local machines for analysis later on. So we, we can keep track of, okay, how many num how, what is the number of policies that I've implemented? It gives you the robustness of the program, right? We, we want to have more policies that represent your business, uh, uh, your business expectations and also the processes. So if, if an issue is identified in a report, what is the process? Who do I contact? Is there a workflow in place? Do I need to open a ticket? Who it is going to? So we need to define those processes too. And account of that also helps. Next, you can think about defining your index around crowdsourcing. So it, it's the aspect of collaboration and it's a very good indicator of your engagement rate, how your end users are interacting with your solution. So things like reviews and ratings, questions and answers. So if you uh, have taken a look at Informatica Data Catalog uh, GUI, it gives you those capabilities and it gives you like an Amazon marketplace experience or Yelp-like experience where we can see what are other users saying about a particular data set or attribute. Okay, so once we have uh, tackled our training KPIs and implementation KPIs, and there is another aspect that we need to take a look at, which is equally important, and that is tracking the operational items. How do you oper operationalize your implementation? So you can uh, define KPIs around number of data governance meetings and maintaining a trend chart for that. So you want to keep this trend healthy, right? Maybe we started in all excitement where we were having our meetings uh, on a weekly basis, but eventually after six months, we see there is a significant dip in that trend. We do not want to lose that traction. And this is a good measure for that. Another KPI is around um, keeping track of number of issues submitted and resolved. Very good indicator how, you, how good your adoption is. And remember the gentleman from webinar one, I think where we talked about the bookseller example that we should go about measuring success from the lens of adoption. And this is a classic example of adoption. How many issues are submitted and is it being resolved in a timely manner? And it also gives us a peek into how well the data owners and stewards are performing their role. Maybe uh, they accepted the role, but they are not engaged in the process. So if there is a workflow waiting for their approval, maybe it's sitting for seven and 10 days, we need to track that. What is the, uh, what is the turnaround time from data owners and stewards? That's another uh, good indicator. Having discussed all of these KPIs, we can come up with a data governance scorecard, like a report card we get usually at the end of examinations 
that tell us how well we have performed, we can maintain a data governance scorecard too. Put the training uh, because the user base will continue to grow as you roll out your program. So you need to keep track of the percentage of enabled stakeholders or the consumers, as well as your implementation cap KPIs. How well are you cataloging your data sets and systems across your uh, data landscape? And then uh, the number of business glossaries that we discussed, the different processes and policies as well. This is, a, uh, this is an excerpt from Informatica Axon uh, Data Governance Solution, which gives you the capability to design an embedded dashboard. So here you see we, have, we are displaying data quality by criticality and data quality by type across different dimensions, completeness, accuracy, and then thresholds are being defined as well. That gives you the visual of how the data quality is performing. So the idea is come up with KPIs across different dimensions, your implementation, see the adoption rate, and then maintain a scorecard so that you can ensure your governance is healthy and it's going the way you expect. That is all I wanted to share with you today to, uh, uh, to give you a sense of how you could go about measuring those KPIs and, and can help your program uh, on track. And before we start taking questions, I want to remind you of the fourth episode where we will talk about how we can design a sustainable governance program. And that's on April 29th, same time. All right, that's all from my side and over to you, Sri, if there are any questions from that. All right, thanks, Lokesh. Um, uh, I'm waiting for the questions to come through. Uh, so as we get questions, we can answer. All right, yeah, um, I have a, a one, two questions. Let me take the one and then Lokesh, I can get your help as well on this. Um, um, all right, okay. How do I trust the uh, data on my report? Um, is that application? I'm not able to read that correct. So how do I trust my data on the reports, which is I believe, okay, all right. I believe this question is um, from one of the slides we discussed, I believe, uh, uh, a slide uh, five or six or seven, I'm not sure where that is from. All right, so um, this is one of the challenges which we we, we do see across um, uh, every organization, right? Uh, reports are produced based on uh, a data which comes from your uh, uh, any one of your data layers uh, being is from your data warehouse or some some scenarios I've seen it comes from some of your staging layers as well. So this is where the uh, the the uh, effectiveness of cataloging uh, uh, plays a significant role. Um, as 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 you take a, a report and you look at the attributes in a report, there may be scenarios where. Um, there is a problem or you feel there is a problem with one of the attributes, let's say, and go, let's go and search for that particular attribute. And what is the, where is the data coming for this particular attribute? Uh, let me go and look at what the upstream applications are. So the lineage within the enterprise data catalog layer can help you to understand where the data is coming from, uh, uh, coming from a certain application source and probably it's staged and it coming to your reporting layer, what transformations, the data goes through what computations and all those stuff. So that that gives you a better does does it really satisfy your business rule which was constructed in the first place? Was that attribute which was defined based on a business rule still your transformation logic from your data lineage is still correct? So that's one aspect. That's to know where the data is really coming from. The second aspect is more significant is your data quality scores, right? Uh, as 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 you keep looking at uh, uh, the scores which is generated on on a on a scheduled basis, maybe once a day, your data quality scores can indicate whether the data which you are getting for that particular attribute has um, has changed over a period of time. And and if that is the case. Um, what what is the cause of it? Is it really uh, the uh, timeliness is your problem? Is it uh, the completeness is a problem? So definitely then you take those data quality scores, you can uh, go back to your lineage uh, into your data catalog and look at which, which stage where the data is really uh, getting changed. And can I produce uh, some scorecards on it to see uh, what's going on and alert those application teams to help me understand that. So two significant ones, the data linear, there's the scorecards, which you, which you produce on a, um, 
uh, on a frequent basis or on a scheduled basis, which can help you to determine uh, whether you can trust that uh, data still coming from your um, the source applications. Uh, Lokesh, do you have anything to add here? Thank you. Okay, so there's um, uh, this question uh, also in 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 line with what we we just answered. How do we go about measuring quality in data definitions, metadata, and data cataloging applications? Very very similar to what I just an answered as well. Uh, I did believe I did cover that uh, um, some of the aspects in my earlier answer. Uh, the um, the, the one, one, one benefit of cataloging is definitely as you do a full scan, you catalog your asset and then you keep doing your uh, incremental scan, any changes your source application gets cataloged and there's a history of uh, those changes which has happened over a period of time. Um, uh, not only you're measuring from metadata perspective, but also from the data perspective, as we profile these uh, application sources and we uh, uh, catalog these profile results, uh, based on some uh, business rule, which has been uh, um, implemented or uh, being assessed at that point of time, where you, you assess the data based on the business rule and you scorecard them as well. Um, uh, those, those definitely help you to uh, determine that. And the, from the measuring data quality measure perspective, every organization is different. Uh, but in general, we go with uh, uh, some uh, generic data quality definitions, like for example, Definitely uh, 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 a validity or an accuracy perspective, uh, whether the data is accurate enough uh, uh, or whether the data is fully complete uh, or uh, whether the data is available for you or for the report when the report gets generated, whether it's available at the point of time. So whether uh, that also plays significant role, whether that the data feed from your ETL process is never completed. So the data is not available for the report to run. In some scenarios we have seen uh, uh, even not an ETL process, but your managed file transfer process, whether the vendor has sent the file at the right time and the data was available for some process to pick it up and uh, uh, go through the transformations to pro pro provide uh, the data for your reporting. So all, all those play a significant role there as well. There's one more question, interesting one. How do we go about measuring quality in data definitions, metadata, and data cataloging applications. Do you want me to take a stab at it? Yes, yeah, please. Okay, so this is uh, from Valerio. Uh, Valerio, the way we have seen this is uh, when we start defining our business glossaries, right? I mean, if it's a spreadsheet, uh, there could be manual controls, but if you are leveraging the products out in the market, typically there will be a business glossary life cycle or a data definition life cycle. So once it is uh, first created, it is usually in the proposed stage and then it is to go through an approval process. So once you propose it, it goes to the draft stage and then there will be multiple approval points, right? There will be approvers, typically a glossary definition owner or a definition steward who will look at the accuracy, completeness, and also make sure that the definition is agreed upon. If, if that is a term that is of interest, for, uh, interest to multiple business and subject areas, then they will also take into account whether everybody is in agreement with the way the definition has been assigned. So with that approval process in place, even before a glossary makes it uh, to be a public, uh, publicly available artifact, uh, we, we can ensure quality in that way that only a well-reviewed uh, and qualified business glossaries are given to the consumers. I don't see any other question uh, on the panel. so. I think we have good. Um, Alex, um, over to actually, you. Actually, you know what, Lokesh? It looks like. I think it looks like we got one question in the chat. Um, it says, What does it mean to only govern critical data? Our driver is compliance. I don't know where critical or sensitive data is until I catalog or inventory it has a source. It seems I need to catalog everything. So the question, what does it mean to only govern critical data? Okay, great point. Yes, so in a way it's right. When we first start cataloging the solution, we want to see what all out is there. Even before we start defining what is critical versus what is not, we need to understand what we have, right? So when we say critical data, we need to come up with a high, def high level definition, like what is critical to me? Customer is critical, product is critical, and anything under purview of that is critical to me. 
So that is criticality from the domain perspective. And then we go to the data set and attributes level. We go about discovering what are the different data sets across different systems and we catalog that. Now, as part of ETL or data warehouse, there will be several measures and dimensions that might not be critical to the business. So a classic example is a surrogate key, right? If you're implementing a slowly changing dimension type two, you will have multiple records with a surrogate key to keep that record unique. We don't want to govern a surrogate key. You only want to uh, uh, govern customer attributes like, okay, first name, last name, his address, his or her address location, zip code, the PI information. And that too, not just at the attribute level, the record as a whole, as an entity, right? So that it, it truly defines the PII. So in a way, I mean, uh, you, are, you are spot on. We need to first catalog what we have and then define a critical domain and go about discovering that critical data uh, within the data sets and attributes. Alex, do you see any more questions? I see one last one. How do we identify the characteristics of a good definition, not the cross-functional agreement? Okay, let me give you an example and I need you to put your creative hat, uh, hat on. If you were to define a spoon, how would you define that? If you say something to eat with, I, and if I keep a fork and a spoon and maybe chopsticks in front of you, all of these are different subject areas, but for that definition, they are something to eat with. But if you define a spoon as maybe an object with a long handle and a oval shaped uh, oval shape at the end, and then you see a fork and a chopstick, you will be able to identify a spoon, right? So a good definition is that is complete, not just in terms of definition, but in terms of its context, as it applies to sensitive or not sensitive, in terms of its ownership. And also we need to keep a track of the question that we answered earlier, what stage is it in draft or proposed and other, uh, other dimensions. So that is one way you can th start thinking about data definition. Customer name is name of a customer. That is a bad definition. Okay, I think that's I think that's it. I don't see any more. Um, so thanks everyone for joining and thank you, Lokesh, for sharing. I hope um, you're all able to join us on the 29th for episode four. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.